Representative Stansberry, thank you so much for joining me today. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you. So in December, you introduced the Water Smart Access for Tribes Act. Um, if this were passed, what, what would it mean for New Mexico's tribes? So the reason why we introduced this bill is that there's so many programs out there that help to support our communities in building out water infrastructure, water con conservation projects and things like that. But one of the major barriers is that they often require a federal cost share. So the community actually has to bring money to the table as well. And what we found is that over history, especially with this program, many of our tribal communities have really found that as a barrier to access. And so this bill would help to waive that cost share so that more of our tribal communities can access those grant programs. And are these um, grants for water quality or water quantity or both? These are mostly programs through the Bureau of Reclamation's Water Smart program. And so that program helps to support especially water conservation initiatives for um, addressing water infrastructure needs, reducing water use, things like that. So um, the, these would be grants for whatever kind of program a tribal community would want to undertake to help improve water management locally within a tribal community. Two other bills to mention, the Infrastructure Bill and the Build Back Better Acts. What could those mean for New Mexico's water infrastructure? Well, the biggest single thing that's happened in water at the federal level over the last year is the passing of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, which happened in November, in which I was proud to support and vote in favor of. And that bill, it makes a $1.2 trillion dollar investment in American infrastructure, including billions and billions of dollars of investments in drinking water and Western water infrastructure. And so that bill passed, it was signed into law. Our president is currently working with our agency to administer those programs. And our state has actually set up also a process by which to get those dollars on the ground. So we anticipate that because of that bill, New Mexico is going to see about $350 million in formula funding for drinking water projects, as well as possibly millions and millions of dollars for all kinds of drought and other uh, water resilience projects. So um, we're working hard with the state. And as you know, our governor has appointed Mike Hammond to help support uh, getting those dollars on the ground. And uh, we're working very closely with our communities to inventory what kinds of projects need funding. And I'll tell you, uh, about a week and a half ago, I joined the governor and other members of the delegation and mayors and local officials from across the state. And water and broadband really are the two top most critical infrastructure issues for our state right now. And so we know that those infrastructure dollars are going to be spent well. But the Build Back Better Act is still in front of Congress. As many of your viewers have been following, we passed it in the House in November, but it still remains to be passed in the Senate. And right now they're back at the negotiating table trying to figure out a path forward for that bill. But what's important about the Build Back Better Act is that it also includes billions of dollars for drought and climate resilience projects, especially focused on water. And in particular, I think this is important for New Mexico with so many of our rural and tribal communities is we have hundreds of communities in New Mexico that really need investments in drinking and wastewater systems. And so uh, the Build Back Better Act includes a tremendous amount of funding also for those really important um, local community water systems and resilience projects as well. So in talking about investments in infrastructure and New Mexico, you know, our audience is familiar with climate change and water challenges. But I think sometimes when we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about infrastructure that was built in the early to mid 20th century that are meeting most of our challenges, but maybe not meeting our challenges into the future. What kinds of investments and changes in infrastructure might we be thinking about and looking forward to that kind of meet the challenges that are coming. Yeah, so I think, you know, as we say here in New Mexico, water is life. We know that water is at the heart of our communities and we have ancient water systems across our state. Our indigenous communities have 
built amazing water infrastructure and practices that continue to this day. Our acequias are still a vital part of our culture and our way of managing water in the state. And among our traditional systems and our historic systems, we're starting to see a lot of changes because of climate change. We're seeing a reduction in snowpack, more intense storms, changes in how water is coming. And in order to adapt to those changes, we're going to have to really change the way we manage water as well as upgrade our infrastructure so that it can respond to more extreme events and changes in our snowpack. So that's one, one aspect of it. Secondly, and I think you touched on this a little bit with your comments, is a lot of the infrastructure that was built in the 19th and 20th century is coming to the end of its design life. And I like to think about this in terms of similar to our electric grid. We built it at a certain time, it served its purpose, and now it's kind of coming to the end of its life. And as we're thinking about the impacts of climate change and drought and our new needs around water and water security, we are going to really need infrastructure that can be managed in real time, that uses the best, best science and technology and data to do so, and that is integrated with our traditional systems and restores our ecosystems and protects our rivers, which are so vital to the health and well being of our communities as well. So, as we're kind of thinking about rebooting on infrastructure in the 21st century, Country, we have to really rethink the way that we address these problems on the ground. And that includes, you know, investing in our traditional communities and the ways in which they manage water, increasing the amount of funding that we spend on data and science and real-time management, and investing in much more resilient infrastructure that mimics the ecological and traditional ways that we manage water for the health of our rivers and our ecosystems. So when it comes to climate change, I feel like so many people in New Mexico, you know, the, the science is clear, we see the impacts, we know what's coming, um, but people often feel kind of helpless because so much action depends on policy changes that come from Congress or even the state legislature. And you've worked on Capitol Hill, you've been a state a uh, congresswoman, now a member of the federal delegation, and you've been such an expert and an advocate on water issues. But I, I just, I have to ask, you know, why do you think that climate change and water planning so often don't rise to the top of, of you know, action and issues for elected officials? You know, I think it's one of the big questions of our time is that climate change is such a complex challenge. And, you know, as I talk to people across our community, I know that climate change is at the forefront of so many people's minds. I get asked about it every day. How do we address it? How do we deal with the crisis in front of us? You know, is there still time? Are we going to be able to address the crisis? And I think that water in particular is so integral to every aspect of our life, our culture, our identity, our survival. Um, but the challenges around addressing our water needs are so complex and so intertwined with the law and infrastructure that sometimes it can feel almost too complicated to try to unpack it all. And so part of why I've spent my entire career working on water policy and water infrastructure questions is because we really need people who can get into the science and the policy and understand how all of those things are interconnected. So, you know, when I look at the policy space and what is in front of us in terms of addressing climate change, I think it's really helpful to break it down into sort of three aspects. You know, we have to address the climate crisis. We have to address our carbon footprint. We know that that's what we have to do to address the climate crisis itself. So that means reducing emissions and doing all of the things we can to fight it at a global level and at a local level. But we also have to address the resilience of our communities because climate change is already here. And of course, as you've reported, we are already seeing the signature of climate change, especially in our water systems here in New Mexico. And we're already seeing reduced snowpack and impacts to our rivers. And so we can't ignore the reality that climate change is already impacting our communities. So we have to focus attention also on helping our communities get through the change that's already here. And then the third aspect of addressing climate change, which we, I think, in many ways have not really begun to tackle um, in a concerted way, is the economic challenge around climate change. And, you know, here in New Mexico, as 
is a state that has long been dependent on extractive industries, really thinking about how do we chart a course towards a more diversified economy looking forward that's more sustainable for our communities. And so I think, you know, sometimes the charge of addressing climate change and its connections to our communities is so huge, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. But when you can break it down into these different pieces, it makes it a little bit more manageable. And, um, you know, we just have to keep doing the work on all three fronts. Right. Well, thank you so much for your work on all three fronts. And it was great talking with you. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here with you today.